Hi, and welcome to Between the Rows. I'll be your host this week, Dave Bedard. This week, we can't not talk about Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We're going to look at what it currently means and doesn't mean for Canada's grain and oilseed producers as we head into the spring. Again, the markets are probably going to be trading with high volatility until they're more or less think that they have it figured out. And for something completely different, we'll be talking about a new competitive funding challenge underway with the goal of building up Canada as a berry-producing powerhouse. Yeah, that's right, berries, like strawberries, blueberries, Saskatoon berries, and so on. Why berries? Well, among other things, that's what we're going to be asking. Having a very narrowly defined problem is important so that teams really know what they're aiming for. Uh, There's really no ambiguity as to whether they've, they've achieved it. And that's all coming up on Between the Rows right after this. We knew we were doing something right when our competition started swearing every time they talked about us. Just the other day, I heard someone saying, Have you seen this f***ing Seedmaster Ultra Pro 2? They got third-party PAMI testing that confirms its individual row metering delivers uniform f***ing seed placement, near zero seed mortality, and no impact on f***ing germination results. We take it as a huge f***ing compliment. Start raising your f***ing ROI at seedmaster.ca. So by the time this episode comes out, the situation on the ground in Ukraine may have changed about a half a dozen times over, but the effects of Russia's invasion on commodity markets can't be ignored. It's uh, late Tuesday morning while we speak, and uh, Chicago May wheat looks to have already climbed again by what's got to be close to limit up after rising and falling and rising again by similar levels over the past week. And Minneapolis and Kansas City wheats, uh, Chicago corn and soybeans, Winnipeg canola, and even Chicago oats have also been hit with some of this new volatility. Uh, Here to help us make sense of it all, we've got uh, Bruce Burnett, the Director of Markets and Weather Information for Glacier Markets Farm. Bruce, hi, and welcome back to Between the Rows. Hello. Hello, Bruce. How are you? Not too bad. So, Bruce, it seems like every time I had you on the show up until about the end of 2020 or so, we were always talking about, you know, the uncertainty that was built into commodity markets because of some implied threat of a trade war and, you know, the the unpredictability of one or more world leaders at the time. So now here we are again, not because of uncertainty of demand, but uncertainty of physical supply. You know, why does why does the grain trade react in this almost sort of manic way in the face of uncertainty? Well, Markets do not like the unknown, and although commodity markets are used to it in some respects, uh, things like weather certainly uh, are are unknowns as you uh, go through a growing season, let's say, but you get more and more information as as you travel along. The problem with this situation is it's something that changes quite dramatically uh, from new slow every hour, um, uh, something different seems to come up. And that's causing the markets to trade uh, uh, in in some pretty high volatility here. Um, Again, the markets are probably going to be trading with high volatility until they're more or less think that they have it figured out in terms of how the situation is going to evolve. But I don't think anyone knows that right at the present moment. Mm hmm. Now let's look at Russia and Ukraine in terms of their in terms of their contribution to the grain trade right up until this past week. You know, obviously, I mean, by comparison, Canada has been short on supply this past year. But but how were Russia and Ukraine doing, uh, in, until up until now anyway, in terms of uh, meeting their grain customers' needs? Well, uh, but Ukraine had a very good crop in 2021, so so they are still in the process of exporting their wheat, um, uh, and still have some. Uh, old crop wheat that they need to sell yet or need to uh, deliver. Uh, in fact, a lot of it is probably sold already. Uh, but unfortunately, that's uh, not going to happen uh, because of the closure of the ports in Ukraine itself. Uh, the Russians had sort of a mixed crop, um, uh, some good yields in some areas, but overall it was down from earlier expectations. Uh, they This caused them to put in an export tax to limit exports this year, and uh, they still have that tax in place. Um, again, as things have evolved here, though, uh, there's not a lot of buyers out there that are willing to take delivery of Russian wheat um, in the in the world market. 
certainly uh, people not wanting to buy, uh, make a new purchase of Russian wheat as well, just because of the uncertainty around the sanctions. Uh, that seems to be an ever evolving story here. Mm-hmm. So, how much? How much do these say? What do we know about these sanctions so far? As 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 far as their impact on Russia's actual ability to export food? Uh, well, again, like um, wheat, corn, um, vegetable oil exports, sunflower sunflower oil, uh, which are important in the region, are not uh, under any uh, official sanctions. Uh, but the uh, financial sanctions that have been put in by the West make it very, very difficult to trade with the Russians right now. And certainly for the Ukrainians, as I said, the ports are closed, so there is no trade going on there right now. Um, but as far as Russian trade goes, uh, it's very difficult to get the normal parts of what you would call trade with uh, another partner underway because of the fact that Everywhere you turn, there's some type of sanction that will be getting in your way. Uh, this won't prevent trade from happening, but the uncertainty does make it uh, about these sanctions makes it far more difficult. Uh, if you think about it right now, if you had a boat that is just loaded with Russian grain, by the time it gets to your port, there may be official sanctions in place that will not allow you to unload it, let's say, in terms of uh, uh, the financial system. So there's a lot of things going on here, and that's why the markets are so volatile. Um, The other issue, I think, uh, that's been underrated in this whole thing is the fact that uh, vessels that are used to transport grain certainly don't want to go into that region right at the moment. Insurance rates have skyrocketed, obviously, Again, with the Ukrainian ports closed, you're not going to see any vessels stray anywhere close to there. But there have been a few vessels hit in the Black Sea uh, from rockets, intentionally or unintentionally, whatever the case may be. Uh, and and so vessel owners are certainly very cautious about sending their boats in to pick up uh, commodities right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and certainly would be asking for a big risk premium in order to do it. Mm-hmm. No, I remember right on day one, the uh, I, I believe there was a, a vessel that was commissioned by or that was chartered by Cargill that got hit in the uh, in the region. I you know whether that to, whether that turned out to be the case or not. I mean, it was the vessel was empty at the time, from what I hear. But uh, that was that was again that was just in the very early days of this conflict. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, and again, uh, vessels are things you can send them anywhere in the world. So. Uh, uh, if you're a vessel owner, you really don't want to go into the Black Sea right now uh, unless you get a substantial premium for it. Um, your insurance costs also for the vessel are higher. Uh, again, usually, uh, depending on the terms of the purchase, uh, uh, someone pays, pays for the insurance on the cargo, but uh, insurance on the vessel is handled by the owner, and that's uh, not a good thing uh, uh, if the risk goes up for that. So you Vessel owners tend to stay away from war uh, zones just just from that fact alone. Mm-hmm. Now, no matter how I say this next, it's going to it's going to sound like I'm talking about profiting off the misfortune of others. And you know, for that, I apologize to everybody out there in advance. But you know, what should the Canadian farmers be be doing right now in terms of their business and in terms of pricing? I mean, there you know, there's not a lot of old crop out there to speak of. But you know, presumably all this snow will go away at some point, and we're going to be trying to put a new crop in. Yes, and again, this is where the biggest impact and the biggest uncertainties are are for next year's crop um, from not only a perspective of our risks, the normal risks that we have every year of putting a crop in, and of course we've been dry from last year's drought and all of that thing, but now there's a, a significant amount of demand from international markets for the crops that we produce in Western Canada. <clears throat> and that's causing the prices to bump up. Um, Russia, Ukraine account for about 25% of the exports from the region, uh, from from the from the Black Sea region, uh, or 25% of the total world exports, um, and total exports from the Black Sea region itself are closer to 30. Um, but realistically speaking, uh, uh, the market is very uncertain about uh, whether or not any of this grain will hit international markets. Uh, in this coming crop year. So uh, the market's prepared right now 
to uh, uh, looking at the supply and demand situation globally and, and essentially factoring in that perhaps that trade doesn't resume normally. Um, the one factor that's causing these markets to go up, though, is basically people have bought grain from the region. It's not going to get delivered. So therefore, they're going to have to cover those purchases from other places. So uh, that's what's causing, uh, especially in corn, because Ukrainian uh, exporters have a very large corn book on right now, especially to China. Uh, and those purchases will have to be deferred or, or, uh, or purchases will have to be added for, from someplace else. So that's causing the corn market to be well supported here um, uh, because of the fact that uh, uh, basically uh, uh, one of your larger exporters of corn in the world has suddenly uh, come into a position where they're not going to be able to export the physical commodity. Mm hmm. So, with uh, in terms of forward pricing, what's a Canadian farmer to do? Uh, well, I think again, these prices are excellent prices. Um, uh, I think there's a lot of reluctance uh, from farmers in Western Canada, especially in those areas that haven't received a lot of precipitation this winter uh, and last fall, uh, and that includes most of the prairie. Still, uh, those areas that are dry. Um, uh, certainly in the back of everybody's mind is, uh, is, is the kind of conditions that we're going to have during this growing season. Hopefully they're good. Uh, in terms of pricing forward, there is a fair amount of risk here. Certainly these are excellent prices, despite the fact that we have a lot higher input costs coming at us this year. Uh, but they, again, as I say, probably that's more of a factor related to whether the local uh, growing conditions right now uh, on on each and every one's farm, rather than uh, 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 that, rather than anything else uh, uh, internationally that's happening here. Eventually, these prices will settle uh, down and and give us a, maybe a little bit clearer signal. But they are going to be quite volatile here. Um, certainly, it would be nice to sell um, these commodities forward, but. Uh, there is a fair amount of uncertainty in terms of what production we're going to have next year here in North America. Mm -hmm. And lastly, uh, as you mentioned before, I mean, we should talk about uh, inputs as well, such as you know, fertilizer and fuel. I mean, is there anything that farmers in Canada should be could or should be doing now to you know to try and prevent sh uh, sticker shock, or are, are we already past that point? Well, again, I think we're past that that point. A lot of farmers. Um, I think did manage to uh, get their fer fertilizer purchases uh, for at least uh, part of their um, requirements for this year already done. Um, uh, again, these prices are very, very high for fertilizers. They have come off for certain types of fertilizer, but they remain very high. Um, the um, negative news, of course, is that Russia is one of the... Uh, uh, larger exporters of fertilizers. Um, they had been they had banned exports earlier this year. So really, I don't think it's as much of a, mar of a market factor as it would have been should uh, should exports have uh, continued. Uh, but still, we're looking at high prices. Um, currently, crude oil is trading over $100 a barrel uh, uh, as well. Um, so uh, we're looking at higher energy costs as well. Uh, so, again, just factor those input costs in when you're looking at new crop prices this year. Mm -hmm. So we've still got a bit of time to, uh, to to watch and see what happens in the meantime. Bruce, thanks very much for your time today. Okay, thank you. Bruce Burnett is Director of Markets and Weather Information for Glacier Markets Farm. You're listening to Between the Rows. I'm your host this week, Dave Bedard.
Uh, just recently, I took in uh, the announcement from the Weston Family Foundation launching what it calls the Homegrown Innovation Challenge. Uh, this competition is seeking teams of innovators to develop ways to extend the growing year for Canadian produce, in this case, berries like strawberries and blueberries. Now, of course, that sounds good to me. Uh, here in Manitoba, a fresh strawberry season can never come soon enough as far as I'm concerned. And we're not talking about reality show or TV bake-off money here either. We're talking about $33 million that the foundation is putting up for this challenge over six years to help participating teams make their ideas happen. Uh, Dr. Evan Fraser is a director with the Arrow Food Institute at the University of Guelph, and he took part in the challenge launch. Uh, Dr. Fraser, hi, and welcome to Between the Rows. Oh, hi. Nice to nice to chat. This is great. Oh, I appreciate it. And now what's what's your role in the uh, in the homegrown innovation challenge? How did how did you get involved? Well, I, I mean, I've worked with the Weston Family Foundation on and off in one capacity or another for qu quite a few years. And they reached out to me sort of shortly after the pandemic hit, thinking uh, they wanted to brainstorm about how they could make a contribution back to Canada, specifically inspired or in light of the, um, uh, of the, of the pandemic. And, and, and so that, that brought me into the conversation, I guess, early in, in their brainstorming. And it was a real privilege and an honor to be able to, uh, to take time and, and brainstorm with them about what they could do. And they were, first of all, they were very committed and interested in, in, in making um, a contribution to Canada with regards to food. And, uh, and I think the members of the foundation board and, and the Weston family grew pretty concerned about issues such as uh, poor quality nutrition and food insecurity that emerged during the um, uh, during during the pandemic. Also, issues linked with uh, temporary foreign workers, and and they were they were you know as we all were 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 deeply concerned about about that issue. And then, of course, the issue of um, of our dependence on uh, on international trade to bring. <coughs> uh, healthy food into our country and and all those things sort of went in together i think and uh, and ultimately they decided that um perhaps perhaps putting a challenge fund together to work on canada's uh fruit and vegetable uh system and and then they scoped it further down to to berries in particular and we can we can talk about why berries in in just a second um and they you know, they decided that that was that was it and so i've i've provided a been a sounding board and a, and a bit of a brainstorming a person to brainstorm with on that one Mm -hmm. So why why the focus then on uh, on berries specifically? I mean, it's an interesting fo not that I'm complaining. It's an interesting focus, but why that why that segment specifically? All right, so so this is this is it's fascinating, and I and I think this is a great decision and a great focus. First of all, um, uh, I had to be convinced of that though. I I thought uh, going broader would initially would have been a smarter idea or would have, you know, let's why, why focus on berries. But, but the idea is, is quite compelling and quite useful. First of all, to have a challenge, run a challenge contest um, or a, like a great big X prize or a, a challenge of this nature, having a very narrowly defined problem is important so that teams really know what they're aiming for. Uh, there's really no ambiguity as to whether they've, they've achieved it. And, um, and so there's a the need for a, for a very clear, narrow focus. That's the first reason. Second reason is it's not just about berries. Berries then become a platform by which other crops can be can be explored. So so if you look into the the details of the challenge, it's using berries as a platform that will be interesting in and of itself, but also then the development of the methods or the ma management practices or the technologies or whatnot will be applicable to other types of, of fresh fruit, fruit and products. So it's sort of a, a, a small window, but that leaps us into a, a much bigger conversation. Um, and then the third thing is berries are quintessentially Canadian, and they wanted to do something that was very Canadian. Uh, there's 200 species of native berries I've learned in my interactions over this file, uh, <laughs> native, native to our country. I didn't know that. That's probably an order of magnitude more than I would have guessed if I'd been asked the question two years ago. Um, but there's a tremendous wealth of, of berries uh, that are in in our in our country um, and then the final reason is i think most nutritionists would say berries are pretty darn healthy so eating more of them is is no bad thing from a health and nutrition perspective and uh and maybe we can get some some health benefits as well by by allowing by by increasing our supply of berries so you put all those four things together and and i think you end up with what's um first of all a, a very articulated a nicely focused challenge but also one that will be kind of fun and like i said quintessentially canadian
Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, we've we've got no problem you know, growing certain kinds of produce in greenhouses in this country. You know, microgreens, leafy greens, uh, you know, uh, lettuce, peppers, that kind of thing. Um, you know, even though you know some of that existing capacity, I know, has since gone into growing you know into growing weed. Uh, but uh, rather than foot, rather than put this funding into seeking out new technology, I mean, is is growing berries indoors in Canada to extend the growing season? Rather, is it not just simply a matter of you know throwing enough money at the problem? You know, building enough greenhouse capacity to scale or is it more complicated than that? Yeah, I mean, it's a super question. And, and the short answer is that it's actually more complicated than that. Um, there are a number of scientific and technical hurdles that have to be overcome before other crops become suitable for, let's just say the more controlled environment growing season set, set, setting. So, I mean, a, a fully controlled environment setting would be like a vertical farm. And right now our vertical farming industry uh, in Canada internationally does um, uh, leaf lettuce and microgreens uh, very effectively. They do it at scale, but it's just leaf greens and mic- and, and leaf lettuce and microgreens. Our, our, our um, greenhouse industry is fabulous. It primarily does cucumbers, peppers, and tomatoes, and and very little else. Uh, though, I mean, just in the last two to three years, we're starting to see indoor strawberries happening. So we're we're moving to, to strawberries. But there's a bunch of scientific and technical hurdles. First of all, like let's just say, um, uh, we need indoor vari- indoor suitable cultivars or uh, varieties of these crops. For instance, I've I've seen uh, head lettuce grown in a vertical farm, and it looks nothing like a head lettuce does when you buy one at the grocery store. Um, so we, we don't have a variety of head lettuce that's suitable for uh, indoor growing conditions or, or, or vertical farming conditions. Similarly, there's all sorts of barriers that are standing in the way of, um, of even strawberries. That's mostly around mechanical harvesting. We don't have the good harvesters. Uh, blueberries are a real, uh, real barrier. Spinach is very difficult to do in, indoors. So we, we, we have, uh, once you step out of the, the ones that we have already established, uh, we've got a situation where there's some big hurdles that need to be overcome. And uh, the logic that the Weston family has adopted in, in creating this challenge is that perhaps by creating a challenge around this, uh, they'll be able to supercharge innovation in this space and, and address some of these hurdles. So it's not just a matter of uh, it's not just a matter of, of, of reaching efficiency then in terms of growing the crops. You've actually got to have a suitable a, suit, a, a berry that's suitable for growing under glass. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, like for, for instance, I'm going to give you a, a, one example drawn from a, a colleague of mine. It's not a berry example, but we could we could extrapolate it to berries. Um, colleague of mine at the University of Guelph, Mike Dixon, does a lot of controlled environment growing, and he can show that um, if you grow the same lettuce seed under blue light versus red light versus white light, you get very, very different lettuces. Uh, mm. Under blue light, it gets quite big. Under red light, it gets purple antioxidants in the leaves. Under white light, it's a control. It's a little bit of both. So we're learning that plants actually have light recipes, just like uh, and that the light recipe interacts with the genetics. So what has to happen from a science perspective, say for strawberries, is we need to breed new varieties of strawberries that are suitable for indoors. And we have to figure out how the strawberry responds to different light wavelengths. And it's possible, uh, I, I've, I've, I've got it on good authority, that it's possible to imagine that properly done, we'll be able to, you know, have extra flavorful strawberries grown under certain kind of light conditions or strawberries of a certain size that are suitable for particular processes, jams versus pies type things. And that we'll be able to have a high degree of precision and control over what the ultimate fruit looks like and how we use it. But we, there's a mixture of genetic work that has to go into the breeding. And there's a bunch of work that has to go into understanding how those plants uh, respond to these more controlled environment settings. Are we going? Are we going to be able to even if we even if we overcome those uh, those obstacles? I mean, are we going to be able to grow berry crops at a, at a at a at a price point per pound that's acceptable to consumers in Canada? That is. Well, that's part of the challenge, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we knew the answer to that, would we have a challenge? Would the Weston Foundation have created a challenge? I, I think the answer is probably yes, but it will take work, which is why why this is an exciting opportunity. I mean, you take the issue of strawberries, for instance, and I know that there's commercial growers um, that are starting to do year round greenhouse strawberries in Ontario. And, and that's super exciting. And their quality of their products is so much better in January than anything you'd be able to get from California. So I mean, it's a much better berry. Is it going to compete? Okay, so I grew up on a strawberry farm in Niagara, my grandparents. Um, is a greenhouse strawberry ever going to compete with a fresh Ontario strawberry picked and eaten, you know, in the same hour? 
I, I'm personally a little skeptical, but if what you're trying to compete with for quality is, say, a strawberry that comes from California in January, I mean, the products you can do in greenhouses now are so much better. So the goal, the goal is to actually, you know, see if we can create a domestic industry in some of these um, these these pro- these crops where we think there's enough evidence to say a nudge, uh, a thirty three million dollar nudge, which sounds like a pretty big nudge if you ask me, but a thirty three million dollar nudge from the Weston Family Foundation, it will will sort of supercharge uh, both the science and the application of the science in order to allow us to develop these things. Are we going to get there? I certainly hope so, and I think the odds are pretty good. Uh, how we're going to get there, though, is is really up to the the innovators who are going to be applying for this challenge. <laughs> now, um, obviously, the challenge isn't just about growing uh, greenhouse cr- greenhouse crops. I mean, there there uh, it seems to me that uh, they they haven't ruled out the idea of uh, of extending the growing season for uh, crops grown outdoors, have they? No, no, that and that's a really good point. So I, I get I get excited imagining greenhouses for vertical farms full of strawberries. Um, oh, me too. And, and and that just makes me excited. And uh, going back to my my grandfather's farm in Niagara, no, there's a lot that can be done to extend the growing season of field crops. And and the the way the the Weston Family Foundation has scoped the challenge opens uh, leaves leaves the the leaves the field literally wide open to participation of of producers and teams and scientists, students, to work on a wide range of different um, different approaches, so you can imagine breeding strawberries which are more to- frost tolerant, for instance. I don't know; I'm just making that up. But you could imagine genetic work that would extend the um, the tolerance zone or the the growing season. You could also imagine management practices. Um, you know, hoop houses are obvious. Uh, you know, st- creating sort of plastic greenhouses on using hoops is is one way that farmers already producers already extend growing seasons. Uh, you know, so so the challenge is more than open and and hoping to attract innovators that might be exploring those sort of options to uh, maybe not get us to year round production in Canada, but certainly make production more viable in more par- parts of the country and across a wider range of the growing season. Mm-hmm. Or or we could just you know, wait for climate change to you know reliably expand the acreage <laughs> base. For <laughs> I mean, uh, although that's, although who knows what's going to go there. <laughs> 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 so i mean do we so obviously there are ways to uh there are ways that we can the, you know within the scope of within within reason that that uh, these crops can be extended or their seasons can be extended outdoors as well that's uh that's good to know i mean so obviously the challenge is open to that as well yeah and and and, and let me let me you know just to, just to really double down on that the you know the the, the way the challenges has been defined is open to any sort of creative idea uh, that would extend and push out at a commercially viable scale our ability to be more sovereign, less dependent on imports uh, across the growing season. And and uh, you know the, one of the nice things about the, these challenge programs in general is they, while giving a very narrowly defined problem berries in this case, they do not prescribe how you solve that problem because you don't want to put constraints on innovation. You want to, you want to constrain the problem, but you don't want to constrain how people get to the problem. And so uh, the, the Weston family, I think very, very astutely has, um, has, has given us a narrow problem, but no guidance on how to solve that problem because that would be putting the cart before the horse in a sense, right? You, you, you don't want to impose limits or barriers on what people's creativity, ingenuity, imagination might come up with to solve that problem. Mm-hmm. Now, as you said, you grew up working summers on a fruit farm in the Niagara region. Uh, you know, with with your own experience, your own personal experience in mind. I mean, is there an issue in, with fruit production in Canada that that you would really like to see a team tackle in this in this challenge? Well, I mean, I'm I'm a nerd when it comes to good quality strawberries. I I think the, a good quality Ontario strawberry, picked fresh at the peak of its growing season, is 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 a is is a piece of art uh, <laughs> is a masterpiece um and and, and i I'm, I'm unabashed about that uh, I, I i and and as a result i grow so deeply offended by the strawberries that you know canadians buy in supermarkets much of the year and this isn't uh i'm not throwing any shade on the on the producers or the industry or the retailers or whatnot but but let's face it the, the cardboardy watery packages of strawberry that come up from California in January just 
aren't very good. And so I would really like a year round supply of good quality strawberries. <laughs> um, so for me, me, the challenge is all about finding the quality berry that we can do, uh, not just for two to three weeks in July, but extend it. And I know some of the greenhouse operators in Ontario are doing an awesome job of moving us in that direction. And I, I you know, the, so the challenge, the part of the challenge, which I am sort of emotionally most invested in is, um, is I'm really hoping that I get to eat some good quality strawberries in January. Mm-hmm. Oh, we had a friend of ours who uh, who would come and visit from uh, from Portage La Prairie in the summer times, and of course he'd be bringing the the excellent Manitoba strawberries with him too. Then he moved to Edmonton. <laughs> then he moved to Edmonton. So uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that as well. <laughs> <laughs> but there's another part of it which I think which is which is really interesting that we haven't talked about yet, and and that's the um, getting back to this issue that there's 200 species of berry uh, native to Canada, and and one of the things that I've really been excited about learning about in 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 my interactions with the Western Family Foundation on this is the extent to which many of these berries are part of indigenous food systems and I, 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 I would love it if uh, one of the outcomes of this was some, some indigenous led teams are catalyzed and inspired to, uh, to think about if there's ways of, of bringing traditional indigenous berries uh, to a wider market, or is there some entrepreneurial opportunity that could be explored there? I'm not really sure where I'm going, where I'm going with this. I just think that there is a, um, there's a, a really interesting opportunity here uh with you know when you step away from blueberries and raspberries and strawberries and the, and the, the typical berries um right. that i i really hope uh one of the benefits of this challenge program is is to throw some light on those mm-hmm. and we look forward to seeing the results certainly and uh the the grand prize of course uh eight million dollars at uh, at the end of all this and uh in 2028 i believe it is yep um would that yeah, be so the, 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 so yep. just just but just a quick word on the architecture. So there is initial grants. I, I I'd have to double check the numbers, but I, as I recall, they're like grants of up to fifty thousand dollars that, and the application is due in the springtime to get teams going and get things established. And then there's a medium medium sized uh, grant that's due about a late this year, if I'm not mistaken. I, I have you'd have to direct your listeners to the um to the website that's got the details. And then there's the grand prize. And the nice thing about this challenge, or one of the neat things about this challenge is that it allows teams to start small and then scale with further investment as things become successful. So yeah, the big prize is for $8 million at the end of the process, but there's a bunch of um, hoops, not hoops, so there's a bunch of markers to get through where you can scale a project up, um, a team could scale a project up as, as they go. Mm-hmm. And we'll certainly look forward to seeing the results of that. Dr. Fraser, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, my pleasure. Nice chatting. You too. Dr. Evan Fraser is a professor of geography at the University of Guelph, specializing in food security and land use change, and he's a director with the Errol Food Institute. Well, that's our time for this week, but check back in this space in seven days for more from the Glacier Farm Media family of publications. Again, I'd like to thank this week's guests, Bruce Burnett of Markets Farm and Evan Fraser of the University of Guelph. This has been Between the Rows, and I've been your host this week, Dave Bedard. Thanks for listening. We knew we were doing something right when our competition started swearing every time they talked about us. Just the other day, I heard someone saying, have you seen this f***ing Seedmaster Ultra Pro 2? They got third-party PAMI testing that confirms its individual row metering delivers uniform f***ing seed placement, near zero seed mortality, and no impact on f***ing germination results. We take it as a huge f***ing compliment. Start raising your f***ing ROI at seedmaster.ca.